everybody welcome to the fired up with cj show we have claudia black here and we we're talking about her book it will never happen to me growing up with addiction as youngsters adults adolescents and adults so welcome back thank you cj so we talked about um we talked about parents and i wanted to talk about the kids um specifically um the different kinds of um shame and fear that they have when it comes to kids i think the message that they internalize isn't just that who i am is not good enough and that there's something wrong with me but and those are ones that are very common for them but is that i'm not lovable and when the most important people in my life um, somehow do not find me lovable, then I can't imagine that anybody else will. And I don't even risk that kind of thing. So what you see is they often act out that I'm not lovable in a variety of ways. And when you grow up with addiction, you're actually growing up with trauma and traumatic stress. And Today, we know that when people have trauma, that they often move into a fight, flight, or freeze response. And that's what you see with these kids who internalize such beliefs and who live with in a chronic state of fear, the fear of the unknown, that which comes with all the unpredictability and this kind of household, not knowing what it is that's gonna happen next. And so with that, I am not lovable and I acted out in a variety of ways. Some of them acted out with anger, with various forms of self-harm. Some of them move into a flight response in terms of emotionally. Uh, they're gonna disconnect from what it is that's going on. Uh, they might use uh, some kind of addictive substance in which to, to separate from what it is that's occurring. And some of them move into that absolute freeze and uh, they become sort of numb as they, sort of move into this world. And as it affects them, as it comes to relationships, I often describe it as I've got two people walking down a railroad track at the same time in the same direction and with the same intent, but there's so, too much distance between those tracks. They don't have the ability to bond, to connect or to be of support to each other. And because I'm unlovable, I can't get very close to you or you're gonna see into my not okayness. You're going to see into that which I'm trying to hide from, I'm trying to hide from it for myself. And I certainly don't want you to see, as I say, how damaged I am or how ugly I am or how defective I am. And so however they move into a fight, flight, or freeze, the goal is to truly not be seen because one more time I would be rejected. Uh, I see. So the when they're in relationships, I I, I think I, I want to make sure I understood your track analogy. If I'm on a relationship walking with someone, I'm never really showing you who I truly am. I'm like walking next to you. You see this like cultivated image of who I am, but it's not really me because I cannot bear for you to think I'm unlovable because mm -hmm. I'm married to you. You're my parent or like whatever it may be, whatever, whoever you're in a relationship with you're going to have this kind of pair, like a false persona that you put on. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. And you had said that, um, um, in your book, you're talking about the hero, the, um, adjuster and lost child, the placator. Um, and we talked about rage before. Tell us a little bit about those roles that you may find children playing. Kids take on roles in all kinds of families. What's different about this highly dysfunctional family system is they take on this role in more of a, a rigid manner because it's more about their survivorship. Whatever I do, I do because it brings me a sense of stability and a greater sense of safety. What is more typical of an older child is to be that highly responsible hero type child. And I become the parent to myself. I become the parent to my siblings. I become the parent to my parents. I know how to take charge. I'm the one who gets the table set with my brothers and sisters at the table and we all, and I make sure that we all have the right expression on our faces. And then you have the caretaker, the placator. Um, another word would be the family social worker. And, and I try not to be too attached to the labels. Um, I, I give a framework for labels and people, I use the labels that people identify with, but they identify with these themes. So this placator is the one who takes care of the emotional needs of the family. Dad did something to disappoint you. I will do whatever I need to do to take that disappointment away. Mom did something to embarrass you. I'll do whatever I need to. 
And then you have the child that the best way for me to survive this family is just disappear into the woodwork. Just don't draw any attention to yourself, no matter what's going on. And then sometimes you have a mascot, the clown, and they their job is to provide some relief to the family. And they do that through being a comic. And then invariably you've got somebody who's angry. You know, they're walking through life with their fist clenched, their arm raised, a finger protruding, saying there's something very wrong in my life and darn well, you will notice. And they do get noticed. They get noticed by the school teacher, maybe the school counselor, maybe even a judge. But what happens is when they get noticed, they get seen as the kid in trouble versus the kid who's in a family that is in trouble. Mm -hmm. But what I want people to pay attention to is there are strengths. It's nice to be caring. It's nice to know how to take charge. It's um, sometimes it is good to just sort of back away and be a bit invisible. And there's, there's strengths with every one of these roles and everybody gets to keep these strengths, but you have to pay attention to what you didn't learn. And with every one of those roles, there will be a list of things that you didn't get to learn. And that's what I talk about in depth um, in It Will Never Happen to Me. I walk through those roles as they look you know, what it looks like as a child and then where it takes you in your adult life. Mm. So I know as a parent, you, I would probably be worried, oh, I hope my son or daughter isn't going to be an addict like my, you know, spouse. Um, ha, is there a way to prevent, um, how do, how, is that a ridiculous idea? Like how does one yes. deal with this situation? Yes. You know, I mean, I think that uh, there's, we know that there um, are risk factors for certain children. And as much as there are risk factors for certain children, there are also uh, protective factors for kids. And a few of those protective factors is the more children have a, a sense of belonging and I can belong to something that is positive in my life. So even if my sense of belonging to my family and this family is really screwed up, can they? Can we do anything to facilitate a sense of belonging in a healthy way outside of the home? And maybe through something recreational, and maybe through something at school. Um, but if if they can somehow be connected to something that gives them a sense of meaning in which they have a sense of belonging, I think the other thing that is really important is even in families that are struggling, what can you do to enhance healthy rituals? And uh, a healthy ritual isn't just um, a holiday ritual or a birthday ritual, is what does it look like in this family at mealtimes? Um, do kids in the morning scatter and nobody says goodbye to anybody as they head out to school? Um, when they come home to school, what, what's that look like? What does dinner time look like, which can be just awful in addictive homes, but what happens at bedtime too? So what can you do to enhance a healthy ritual in the context of this family? And it doesn't have to be real sophisticated. I mean, maybe at bedtime, everybody just sort of disappears. So maybe the ritual is the non-addictive parent now goes into the bedroom and just acknowledges, you know, I hope you get a good night's sleep. Right. Or, or how was and your what, day? And what is the importance of the ritual for kids who, uh, with fa families like that? What it really in implies to the kids is that, um, that there is a sense of belonging here and, and in a healthy way um, that we have meaning in the context of this family. We're not just all grown you know, inside this house you know, trying to protect ourselves. Um, I think with also those rituals, there's that sense of I'm being noticed in a positive way. You know, the ritual is maybe your child comes home from school and I realize we're in a pandemic right now. So that's not always happening, but nobody's gonna be at home for two and a half hours. Um, can there be a text? Can there be a note? I mean, just being acknowledged um, is going to be healthy. I think the other thing that is really important with uh, building strength with kids is if they can have a relationship with um, somebody outside of that family, another adult that somehow uh, and sometimes, you know, this can be a, this can be the guy down at the corner who's working on cars and he's a mechanic. You just sort of hang around in his his garage and he somehow lets you know that he likes the fact that you're around and he's going to teach you a few things. So, again, it doesn't have to be a therapist. It can be a neighbor. It can be an extended family member. It can be somebody at school is often plays that role. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and, and would you suggest, when would you suggest going to a therapist in those situations? Or what situations would you suggest going to a therapist? I think that when you see your child withdrawing, when you see your child um, lacking impulse control, when uh, you see your child, you're, the withdrawing is often anxiety, but in fact, it could be depression. Uh, when you see them start to engage in self-harm, banging their head against the wall, maybe cutting into themselves. You know, I don't think the therapist has to be the first option at all. Um, you know, we want healthy boundaries with our children. Uh, we want to give them messages, health, healthy messages, um, any kind of just basic healthy parenting so that in an addicted family, the central organizing feature becomes the addict. And the more we can keep that, not what the family organizes around, the more stable that family system will be. Mm. Okay, and, and, and before we conclude, I wanna ask you quickly about um, about adopted kids. Um, and um, oftentimes you see a lot of adopted kids having a parent, one parent who was um, addicted, which is why they're given up for adoption. And, um, I wanted to talk, I know it's kind of hard, but is there a way that you can talk a little bit about um, the hardship sometimes when you're actually, you have a wonderful family, great loving family that is your new fa- you know, adopted family, but the kid still actually has issues of the addictions and the kind of um, problems you may see in that scenario. First of all, let me say that some kids who are adopted, everything turns out really wonderfully beautiful. Other kids are adopted and sometimes they're not adopted to the healthiest of families. And so then you have an added dynamic. But let's say we have an adopted child and does come into a family that you know has done the best they can and had a lot of skills and had a lot of love. Sometimes depends on is that child adopted at birth or what happened before they were adopted and they might be two, three, four, five, six years of age. That makes a big difference. When there's difficulty, it usually has to do with what we call attachment disruption and that that child really lacks in a capacity in which to bond to somebody else. And that can even have to do with neglect that took place in utero with the child, and we can't underestimate that. Um, and, but the way, way, the way you see it acted out is oftentimes they're gonna prove that they're not lovable. They're gonna prove that they deserve to be rejected. They're going to prove that there must have been something wrong with them if they had to be given up. And so they'll go to a lot of behavior that's going to push somebody away. So it takes that much more strength um, on the part of these newly adopted parents to um, to hang in there with that child right. and not ultimately get frustrated and, and back away from healthy parenting. Um, and, and we see that pushing away, you know, these kids are going to do it four, five, six, seven years of age. They're going to do wow. it 14 years of age. And uh, we see them struggle with, uh, you know, they want to exert some control in their life because they've not had control in their life. And that gets in the way um, of their relationship with their parents. But the biggest thing is they're going to just prove that they're not worthy. That they're not right. Healthy. Right. So no matter what, you may be a great parent and everything you know, to the best of your ability and still have a child who is following the path of their parent yes. being addicted because they're just trying to prove to you, see, I, I just need you to prove to me. I need to prove that I'm all, I'm not lovable because, and, and I'm going to test you over and over again. And I think, one, it's just hard to be a parent and have great parenting skills to begin with. Yes, agree. But um, in that kind of situation, this is often people who really do need to be in therapy, you know, as parents you need somebody to help guide you and reinforce healthy parenting in the face of this rejection that you're getting. And, you know, parents can end up being very angry. You know, I've given up so much, you know, and not that they say this to adopt you and all I get is being slapped in the face. So you're going to need some real support here. And at the same time, this child is going to not just need support. um, This child is going to need somebody to really work with them about what this is about. And And sometimes by then, sometimes addiction's taken over, and then that's the first and foremost issue. Yep. So many. It's um, so hard to see so many people 
hurting from, you know, these, so like you said, the generational things. I mean, it's yeah. just generational things. Um, so informative. We've been talking to Claudia Black about her book. It will never happen to me growing up with addiction as youngsters, adolescents, and adults. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, CJ. This is a really important topic. Thank you.